In the last eight years, I've officiated at 19 funerals here and other congregations. And I've attended perhaps another 20 or so that Marty and, and others have conducted here at Choctaw and elsewhere. It's a lot of funerals. When you participate in so many funerals, you begin to see similarities and patterns in each one of these. You also are moved to think about your own funeral and what people will say about you when you're gone. I actually conducted a funeral in California for a man who was still alive and sitting in the uh, cry room watching his own funeral. He had wanted his funeral you know, to be conducted while he was still alive. We had a full funeral, the whole thing, obituary, and we just left out the date at when he passed. And, and the interesting thing about that funeral is that it went on so long that he went home. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he passed away a day after, one, one day after he, he had cancer, terminal cancer, he passed away one day later. And that cured me forever. You know, this business, everybody thinks of this, you, know, you got to admit it, you know. I wonder what it'd be like to be at my own funeral, you know. That cured me, that experience cured me forever for ever wanting to be at my own funeral. I'd like to focus on uh, four particular funerals that I have done to demonstrate a pattern that was common to every funeral that I preached or simply attended to as a, as a guest, because there's a pattern to them. And I kind of boiled it down to four funerals. I noticed that there was an element or a feature common to all funerals and that this one feature determined what was said and how people felt about the deceased, regardless of that person's age or gender or occupation. The four funerals. Now for the most part, these four funerals were regular style funeral services, just pretty straightforward funerals. Four funerals, two men, two women, who all died in their 50s, three of them from heart attacks, one of them from cancer. All had families that loved them and each had had contact in one way or another with the church. What was interesting about each, however, was how each funeral tried to deal with the passing of the individual. I noticed that each service was different not because of age or sex or culture that each had, no. Each, uh, uh, I noticed that each service was different because the funeral services and the eulogies were different based on the type of faith that each had displayed during the time that they lived. For example, one funeral was for a person who had lived a life of no faith. This was a person who gave no thought to faith, didn't know about the things of faith, did not live by faith. This person had a broken life filled with addiction, emotional and physical problems. He died alone and left nothing but sad memories behind. At his funeral, people cried out of hurt and regret for the things that might have been, but were never realized. The family hoped that God would be merciful and they prayed that other deceased relatives would take care of him in heaven. The best that they could hope for and what was mentioned quite often throughout the funeral was that he was at peace now and wouldn't have to suffer anymore. That was the best that they were hoping for. The next funeral was for a person who had a life of careless faith. This person grew up in a family where Christ was Lord and all the children were trained in the Bible and they had a life of service and faith to the church. Even at his funeral, his sisters spoke of their ongoing faith and the the devotion of their parents who had died long ago. But the deceased, while he lived, 
neglected to follow in the footsteps of his parents, his sisters, his nieces, his nephews, as faithful Christians. Religion, church, faith, service in the name of Christ, these were things he carelessly avoided. Even if they surrounded him through his family and through their example to him. He died suddenly, in his kitchen actually. And at the funeral, the only things that were said about him and his life, three things I remember them, they struck me. Number one, he loved his family. Number two, he was a good mechanic. Number three, he enjoyed owning a dog. That was it, that was the legacy. No one mentioned heaven. Not a word was spoken concerning reward. No one spoke the words joy or peace in death for a person who carelessly ignored those things while he was living. The feeling among the surviving family was sadness and regret and loss for one who was so close but neglected to believe. Careless faith. The next funeral <clears throat> was for one who did have faith, but a life of unfinished faith. This for me was the saddest of funerals because it was for a person who had been baptized, had been a faithful member of the church for many years and then for some reason stopped coming to church. There may have been a good reason for her to be discouraged or offended or weak, but her way of handling her problem was to stop practicing her faith. This may have been the key factor that also caused her husband and children to fall away from the faith as well. Well, if she's not going, well, you know, why should I go? And the kids, you know, well, if mom and dad are not going, well, I'm not certainly going to go. Her wishes were that no religious ceremony be conducted at her funeral services. So as a result, there was a combination of poems and candles and letters and tears. Her eulogy spoke of her garden, how she loved her grandchildren, how everyone will miss her, all things that were true. The person presiding over the funeral mentioned God and heaven, but no one mentioned anything about the deceased's faith in God or her confidence in Christ for heaven. The most hope that anyone mentioned was that God was merciful. There's that God is merciful thing again. That's the best that an unfinished faith can hope for. Hope that God will be merciful despite your unfinished faith. And then finally there was a funeral for a life full of faith. This one was conducted for a woman whose life was a testimony to her faith. She suffered from cancer for several years and she died at 59 years of age, leaving behind a husband of 41 years, three daughters and grandchildren. Although like the others, she had a funeral service, hers was very different from theirs. The entire ceremony was designed to celebrate her life of unwavering faith and bring people together to worship God one last time because of her. There were many prayers, but none of them were begging for God's mercy. The prayers were praising God for allowing those to have known this woman. Thank you God for allowing us to have this woman as our mother, as our grandmother, as our friend, as our sister in Christ. Those were the prayers that were being offered. Her eulogy spoke of her faith and faithfulness, her service to others in Christ's name, her example of faith to her family and her friends, right to her dying day. The comments and the prayers were full of joy and confidence and gratitude and assurance that the rewards of heaven were now hers because of her faith. I left that funeral encouraged lifted up, more confident to face my own death when it comes. And so the question that naturally arises from these experiences as far as we're concerned is this. What kind of funeral will each of us have? Because each of us 
will have a funeral of some kind. We know that each of us will indeed have some kind of funeral because we all will die. But what will be said at our funeral? Who will it be for? Will it be for someone who never believed because no one taught us? Or because we love the world of sin so much that the light of truth never got into us? I doubt this would be our funeral since we're all here at worship this morning, but it has to be mentioned nevertheless. But it will be the funeral of many of our friends and family if we don't share the gospel with them, don't encourage them and continue to encourage them to believe. Or will it be a funeral for a procrastinator, someone who will put off believing, I'll believe tomorrow or when I get married, that'll be the time, you know, got to get back to church with the kids, you know. Uh, when we have children, we'll really get involved at that time. You know, I think we'll, we'll get back when I see the need. Right now, we're so busy. When I, when I get better, you know, the health is not good. And what's good going to church if you're going to miss because of your health? You know, I'll just wait till I'm just better or I'm older or I'm wiser or when I feel like it. Of course, this type of thinking does not take into account that God gives us just so many hours and minutes, so many seconds, so many heartbeats. And when our time is up for living, so is our time up for believing. No one's converted in heaven, only on earth. You know, three out of the four people who died that I'm talking about were taken by surprise by their own deaths. Only the woman who had terminal cancer knew that her death was, was just coming. The other three were all caught by surprise. They didn't think they were going to die at 59. Will our funeral be for someone who used to believe? You know, the promise of heaven is for those who believe now, at the moment of death, not for those who used to believe. Abraham and David and Peter and Dorcas and Paul and others, they believed on their deathbeds. They were not perfect, they sinned, they failed, they struggled, but on the day they died their faith was alive and influencing their lives and the lives of those around them. The joyful celebration that people have at funerals are for those people who finished their lives as faithful disciples, not people who started faithfully, but they quit along the way. There's no special joy felt at the passing of Esau, you ever notice that? Or King Saul, or Lot's wife, or Judas, or Demas, all people who used to believe, or believed for a time. They all started well, but they let go their faith before the end. And the Bible does not celebrate their lives nor their deaths. There's no special in corner you know, in heaven for those who used to believe. Hopefully, my hope for me and certainly for you, our funerals will be for people who believed and demonstrated that faith all throughout their lives. Has life been up and down? You bet it's up and down. Is faith up and down? You bet faith is up and down. But it's always there. If you had to write your own eulogy now, what would it say? If you had to plan your own funeral today, what kind of funeral would it be? Hopefully the main thing that people would say about us would be that we were faithful to the end. I don't know much about sister so-and-so, but all I do know is she was a faithful Christian woman. And believe me, that's all they have to know. The fact that we loved our families, we had a good dog, we spent hours at the gym or garden or in the kitchen, has no effect on our eternal souls, none whatsoever. The only thing that we can do in this life that has influence in the next life is to have consistent faith in Jesus Christ, period. That's the only thing that affects that. The only good, valid, biblical reason to have a, a hope in heaven is if we believed or not and continued to do so right up until the end. If this is what is foremost in your life, then your funeral can be a celebration. And those who are left behind can have a real hope 
to see you again one day. You know, people can read all the poems they want and they can appeal to dead relatives who have gone on before, but when it comes to funerals, the one who, who rose from the dead still offers the best guarantee of eternal life to those of us who must face death one day. He's the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And when you say, yes, I believe this, I believe this today and I believe it tomorrow and my plan is to continue believing it day after day after day until the day of my death, this is what leads us into heaven and nothing else. Note that this passage, or rather in this passage, Jesus uses the present continuous term believes. Not one who doesn't believe or plans to believe in the future or used to believe in the past. No, he says, the one who believes now and continues to believe until Jesus comes for him, this is the one who will live and never die. So I ask again, what kind of funeral do you want to have? You want a funeral for a living person, not a dead one. For a person of faith who believes in Jesus and in doing so will live even after he or she dies. So if you're not that person of faith, or if you have put off believing, or if you have let your faith fall, I encourage you to fill out a prayer card for prayer, or come forward to repent of your sins, or come forward to confess Jesus as your Lord and be baptized in His name, so that you will be prepared for your funeral whenever that day comes. Shall we stand and sing our song of encouragement?